Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. This is Lecture 20, Matrices and Determinants. Last time, we spoke about electric circuits and how Newton's law uh, brought in differential equations to their description. This time, we're going to switch gears in preparation for what comes next in differential equations. We're going to start a very quick overview of linear algebra. Right? Just the parts of linear algebra that we're going to need. All right, so this will be part one of that overview. Okay, so a matrix is a rectangular array of numbers. All right, so for us, that means uh, either real numbers or complex numbers. So for example, the matrix M given by one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? This is a matrix of size two by three. Okay, so uh, a couple things to say here. First, this two by three, this doesn't mean two times three. So you don't say this has is a matrix of size six. The, the, you, you keep the two numbers separate. So just two by three. And uh, the way we uh, say the size of a matrix is always you count down and then you count across, right? So I like to remember that for naming a matrix, you go down then across. For multiplying matrices, which we'll do in a moment, you could do the other parts of the rectangle. You go across and then down. But for now, for naming, you go down, then across. The entries in a matrix are denoted. Sometimes if you have capital M as the labeling the matrix, then you use little m sub ij to denote the individual entries. Or maybe you use capital M sub IJ, or you do capital M inside square brackets to indicate that that's the matrix, and then you put sub IJ. So you'll see us use all three of these. But in every case, the first index, so the I, denotes the row. And the second index, so the J, denotes the column. Right? Thus, for a matrix of size two by three, you would say this entry is the entry one, one, this is the entry one, two, this is the entry one, three, this is the entry two, one, the entry two, two, and the entry two, three. Sometimes we write capital M is equal to, and then you put parentheses, little m, i sub j, sub i sub j, and then you put i goes from one to two, j goes from one to three. Okay. A matrix of size n by one, right? So that means that you have a single column and that column has n entries in it, is also called a column vector, right? Or just a vector. And a matrix of size one by n is also called a row vector. 
right? So as I'm indicating here, the default is uh, a vector refers to a column vector. Rn denotes the space of column vectors. of size n with real entries cn those with complex entries okay uh, when you have matrices you have two operations to start with first you have scalar multiplication Right, so here you're given a scalar, right? So by a scalar, we mean a number. We might mean a real number if we're working with real matrices or a complex number if we're working with complex matrices. So let's call that scalar C, right? And a matrix, capital M. Then we find a new matrix, little c times capital M, by multiplying every entry in M by little c. So for example, if M is the matrix we had a moment ago, so one, two, three, four, five, six, then two times M would be two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, right? So another operation is addition. If you have two matrices, A and B, and they have the same size, then we find A plus B by adding each entry of A with the corresponding entry of B. So, For example, if A is the if A is the matrix one two three four five six, and B is the matrix seven eight nine ten eleven twelve, right? Since since this are these are both two by three matrices, we can add them together and get another matrix of size two by three. So that would be A plus B, eight ten. 12, 14, 16, 18, right? Where, for example, to find this 16, we start with this five and we add this 11, right? So these operations satisfy the usual rules you would expect. So for example, if you do a scalar A times scalar B times M, then it doesn't matter if you do scalar multiplication first or multiply with the matrix, if you add matrices, that's commutative. You can do it in either order. If you have a matrix and you add the zero matrix, you end up with the matrix you started with. So here, this is the matrix of zeros, right? If you do little a times capital A plus B, that's the same as doing little a times capital A plus little a times capital B. 
if you do little a plus little b times capital A, that's the same as little a times capital A plus little b times capital A, and so on. Right. So scalar multiplication and addition work exactly the way you would expect, no surprises. Right. So next, let's talk about matrix multiplication. If A has size M1 times N1, and B has size M2 times N2, then we can multiply A times B if N1 is equal to M2, right? So that is to say here, right? The number of columns of A has to equal the number of rows of B. And in that case, A times B is a matrix of size M1 cross N2, right? So right, you have A times B, and here A is a matrix of size M1 cross N1, B is a matrix of size M2 cross N2, right? And we're gonna end up with A times B of size M1 cross M2, right? So this is size of A, this is size of B. So the way it works is that only if these two contiguous dimensions are the same, does it make sense to do the product? And then it's like these two cancel out and you end up with the remaining ones, right? So these two have to match and then they sort of cancel out when you're computing the size, okay? The formula for the entries of A times B is this one. So if I have the matrix AB and I look at its ijth entry, then I can compute this as the sum K goes from one to N1 of the IK entry of A times the KJ entry of B, right? So you, you see this sum goes over this index, which is the second index of A and the first index of B. And so that's why we need these two numbers to be the same for this sum to even make sense. Right? And here I, I wrote it as being a sum up to N1. I could also have written it as a sum up to M2 because it's the same number. Right? Okay, so that's a formula. But the way you want to think about it is that the IJ entry of A times B is the dot product, right? The dot product you're all um, familiar with from Rn of the ith row of A with the jth column of B. Okay. So again, that that talks to the fact that we need these to be equal for the product to make any sense, because when we take the ith row of A, it has to have the same number of entries as the jth column of B in order to take the dot product. So let's start with an example where the product doesn't make any sense. Right. So for example, if we started with the matrices we had a moment ago, one, two, three, four, five, six, and B, 
seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, right? So these are matrices of the same size, which was important because it allowed us to add them together, right? But this is a matrix of size two by three. This is a matrix of size two by three. And because these numbers do not match, then A times B doesn't make sense. Right? And because these numbers do not match, B times A also does not make sense. Okay, let's do an example where things do make sense. So let's say that a stays the same, one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's take B to be um, one, zero, minus one, uh, one, two, three, right? So now this is a two by three matrix, and this is a three by two matrix. So when we multiply them together, right? A times B, these three sort of cancel out and we're gonna end up with a two by two. And B, A also makes sense because this number is the same as this number and we're gonna end up with a three by three. Okay, let's work these out. So A times B, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and B one, zero minus one, one, two, three, right? So it's gonna be a two by two, right? To find the first entry, I take the first row, dot product the first column, right? So if I do this dot this, I'm doing one times one plus two times zero plus three times minus one. Right, so I end up with minus two, right? Then to find this entry, right? This is in the position one, two. So I should take the first row times the second column, right? First row dot product with the second column. So that's one times one plus two times two plus three times three. So that's one plus four plus nine. So that's 14. To find this entry, I have to take the dot product of this row with this column, right? So it's in the position uh, two, one. So it's second row, first column, right? If I do this dot product, I have four times one plus five times zero plus six times minus one. So that's again, minus two. And then to find this entry, this is in position two, two. So I take the second row, second column, and I do the dot product, right? So that's four times one plus five times two plus six times three. So that's four plus 10 plus 18. So that's 32. Okay, and then if we want to compute B times A, right? So that's B first, two, three, Three, four, six. Okay, so I'm going to end up with three by three, right? To find the first entry, right? It's entry one, one. So I should take the first row, dot product, the first column. So that's one times one plus one times four. So that's five, right? Similarly, for this one, I should do this dot this. So that's two plus five is seven. This one is going to be the first row dot the third column, so that's nine. Then for these three, I'm going to use this row and then I'm going to dot it with each of these columns, right? So I'm going to end up with eight, 10, 12. And then to find these three entries, I'm going to take this row and dot it with these three columns, right? So I'm end up with 12 minus one is 11, 15 minus two is 13 and 18 minus three it's 15. Okay, so that's how we do these products. Uh, notice that A times B and B times A 
can be different sizes. Even when they are the same size, they do not need to be equal. So for example, if A is the matrix 0, 1, 0, 0, and B is the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, then A times B is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, and B times A is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. So AB is not the same as BA. Okay, so that's really important. That's a big difference with what we're used to when multiplying numbers is that multiplication of matrices, even when they both make sense, even when they're the same size, they don't need to be equal. Okay. Um, if, so, if A has size m by n, then let's think about the special case of matrix vector multiplication, right? So that's a special case of matrix matrix multiplication. So whenever V is a vector of Rn, so remember that means a column of size n by one, right? So then the product with this matrix makes sense. Uh, and we have A times V is going to be a vector of size M, right? Because it's going to be, right? M times N times, so M times N times N times one. So the N's cancel and I end up with M times one. So A sends by multiplication vectors in Rn to vectors in Rm. The null space of A, which we denote null of A, is the set of vectors in Rn such that a times v is equal to the zero vector inside Rm, right? So all of the vectors that a sends to zero, that's the null space of a, right? The null space of a is really important. We're gonna talk a lot about it when we start talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And at the moment, I just wanna point out that uh, the null space of any matrix A is closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition, right? That is to say, if you have a vector in the null space of A, then C times that vector is also in the null space of A for any C. And if you have two vectors, V and W, in the null space of A, then V plus W is also in the null space of A. Okay, that's easy to check. I will let you check it. Okay, another thing I want to point out now that we can multiply matrices is the identity matrix. The identity matrix uh, 
of size n by n is the matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. So for example, the identity, the two by two identity would be one, zero, zero, one. The three by three identity would be one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, and so on. Right? The identity matrix has the property that I times A is equal to A and B times I is equal to B. Whenever these products make sense, right? So as long as you can multiply by the identity, multiplying by the identity doesn't do anything to the matrix, leaves it the same. We say that a matrix A is invertible if there exists a matrix B such that the product of A with B is equal to the identity and the product with B of B times A is also equal to the identity. Right? In that case, right? So if you have matrices A and B that satisfy these two equations, then A and B must be square matrices. Of the same size. And there is only one such matrix B So because there's only one of them, we give it a special symbol. We denote it a to the minus one. And we call it the inverse of a. Okay. So not every matrix has an inverse. And a very useful characterization is that a matrix A, a square matrix, is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to zero. So let's talk about the determinant. We define the determinant inductively. Right? Inductively on the size of a matrix. So if I should start by defining it on the smallest matrices. If A has size one by one, right? that means that A has a single entry And we define the determinant of A to just be that entry. Okay, so what if uh, A is larger? If A is a square matrix, so we only define the determinant for square matrices. of size n by n, right, with entries 
little a i j, then to define its determinant, we pick a row, any row. Say we pick the ith row. And then the determinant of A is defined to be the sum when J goes from 1 to N of minus 1 to the I plus J, little a i j, then determinant I sub J of capital A, where determinant I sub J of capital A is the determinant of the matrix obtained by deleting the ith row and jth column of A. Okay, so if you start out with an n by n matrix and you delete one row and one column, then you end up with a matrix of size n minus one times n minus one. And so inductively, you already know how to take its determinant. And so that's what goes here. This formulation is known as the Laplace expansion along the ith row. So let's work out two by two and three, three by three case using the first row. So I'll label this the Laplace expansion. Along the first row. So the determinant of a two by two matrix, right? I could write it as A11, A12, A21, A22, right? Let me introduce more notation. Sometimes instead of writing the determinant of a matrix, we just put the matrix between two vertical lines, right? So what I'm gonna do is here this I, I'm gonna choose I equal to one. So I'm gonna use the first row. And so this would be a sum, I, J goes from one to two. And so I'm gonna have minus one to the one plus one a11 one, one, times the determinant of the matrix I get by deleting the first row and the first column. So that just leaves this entry. So I'm going to be taking the determinant of the matrix with a single entry, which is a22. Two, two. And then I'm going to add minus one to the one plus two, a sub one, two determinant. And so now I'm going to delete the first row and the second column. So all that's left is this, and that's the matrix I'll put here, A21. Right. So, okay, what is that? So minus one to the one plus one, that's one. So I end up with A11, and then the determinant of this one by one matrix is just that single entry. Then here, minus one to the one plus two, that's minus one. And then I have this A12, and the determinant of A21, that's just A21. Right, so that's the formula we all know and love for the determinant of a two by two matrix. Let's work out the three by three case. Actually, let's go ahead and use this other notation. So suppose you have A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33. So again, I'm gonna use the first row. So I'm gonna have minus one to the one plus one, A11, one, one, and then the determinant of a two by two matrix. So what we do is we delete the first row and the first column. So what's left is this. So that's what I put here. A22, A23, A32, A33. 
right? Then I go to the next entry in the first row. So minus one to the one plus two, A one, two, and then the determinant of a two by two matrix. So this one, I'm gonna delete the first row and the second column. So what's left is this and this, A two, one, A two, three, a three one, A three three. Then I go to the third entry in the first row. And I have the determinant. I'm going to delete the first row in the third column. So I'm left with this. So A two one, A two two, A three one, A three two. Okay, so that's A11, and we already know how to compute the determinant of the two by two matrix because we just worked that out. So we can just use that now. So here I have A22, A33, minus A23, A32. Then I have minus A12 times the determinant of this matrix. So A21, A33, minus A23, A31. And then plus A13. times the determinant of this matrix, so A21, A32, minus A22, A31. Okay, and that's the formula for the determinant of the three by three matrix. Of course, for these sizes, you know that you do uh, the forward diagonal minus the backward diagonal, and right, and that works also for the three by three, there's your forward diagonals and your backward diagonals. Right, that pattern stops with three by three. So the determinant of a four by four matrix is not just looking at the diagonals, right? But you can find the determinant of a four by four matrix by just using this Laplace expansion along whatever row you like. Right. Let me immediately point out that you can also compute the determinant using the Laplace expansion along the column, right? That is to say, for any fixed J, the determinant of a matrix is given by the sum and I goes from one to N of minus one to the I plus J, A I J, determinant sub I J of A, right? So it's the same formula, except that now we're summing over the I's instead of summing over the J's. Okay, <clears throat> let's write down some of the most useful properties of the determinant of A. So first, the determinant is a linear function of the rows. So what does that mean? Well, let me show you in an example. Suppose you had a three by three matrix, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the third row as a sum like so. So I'm going to have Okay, so this third row is a linear combination of two row vectors. One of them has entries A31, A32, A33, and the other one is C times the vector B1, B2, B3. And the determinant being a linear function means that I can write this as the determinant when
For the third row, I put the row vector with the A, so A31, A32, A33, plus C times the determinant when I put for the third row, the row vector with the Bs, right? So anytime you write one row as a linear combination of different vectors, the determinant ends up being the determinant for one of those row vectors plus the determinant for the other row vector. And if you have a multiple, then you can just pull out that multiple, right? So I did this for the three by three case and the third row, but it's true for n by n matrices and whichever row you like. It's also true for the columns. The determinant is a linear function of the columns, but I'm just going to stick with the rows for right now. Second useful property is that if we switch to rows, of a matrix, <clears throat> then the determinant change a sign. So for example, let's stick with two by two. If you have the determinant of A11, A12, A21, A22, right, then this is minus the determinant if I write the same matrix, but I switch the order of the rows. Right? And again, this is true for n by n matrices and whichever two rows you decide to switch. Third useful property is that the determinant of the identity matrix is one. Right. <clears throat> so as a remark, these three properties characterize the determinant. So the determinant is the only function satisfying these three properties. Okay, more properties. The determinant of a product of two matrices, square matrices of the same size, is equal to the product of the determinants. Fifth property, the determinant of A is non-zero, right? This was our initial motivation for bringing up determinants, is that determinant of A is not zero if and only if A is invertible. Right? Here are some other equivalent properties. It's also if and only if the rows of A are linearly independent, and it's also if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. Okay. Another useful property is that the determinant is equal to the signed volume of the parallelepiped spanned by the columns of A. Okay, so you can take the columns of A and form a parallelepiped in Rn. And the determinant will tell you the volume of that parallelepiped. Here, the sign has to do with the orientation. Like, do the columns of A, in the order that they're presented, preserve the natural orientation of Rn? So if you know about orientation, that's what it means. If you don't know about orientation, don't worry too much about it. But that's what the sign of the determinant means. Okay. 
So we'll stop there for now and do more linear algebra next time.